Okay, we're going to look at the first question on the 2017 AP chemistry exam. Um, it starts off here with an equation. So we have carbon disulfide plus chlorine, three chlorines, turn into carbon tetrachloride and S2Cl2. So it says uh, carbon tetrachloride can be synthesized according to the reaction represented above. A chemist runs a reaction at a constant temperature of 120 degrees in a rigid 25.0 liter container. Uh, chlorine gas is initially present in the container at a pressure of 0.4 atmospheres. How many moles of chlorine are in the container? So when we look at this, we start seeing some things. Here's the, see, they wanted to have moles, and we're given a pressure, and we're given a volume, and here's a temperature, and that temperature is in Celsius, so I'm going to immediately add 273 uh, before I forget, so that's going to be 393 Kelvin. So it uh, looks like I have everything I need to do PV equals NRT. And that will allow me to, to solve for moles. So the number of moles is going to be PV over RT. And R, I can get that value from uh, the chart that comes with the test. So let's look at how this is done. So PV equals NRT. I solve for N. And I put in my 0.4 atmospheres, 25 liters. This is from the chart, 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin and 393 Kelvin. And when I put this together, my liters are going to cancel out, my atmospheres cancel out, my uh, uh, a, uh, temperature Kelvin cancels out. And so I live with moles in the bottom, which is going to be moles in the top. And with my calculator, I get 0 0.31008, which I round off to 0 0.0. Uh, 3, 1, because that number there is a two significant figure number. So here's my first uh, answer, part A, and it's going to be 0 0.31 moles, and that is worth one point on this question out of 10. Okay, the second part up here, it says how many grams of carbon disulfide are needed, how many grams of carbon disulfide are needed in order to completely react the chlorine. So I can see I've got a 3 to 1 ratio here, and it's a pretty simple stoichiometry kind of problem. So first off, I have my carbon disulfide, I calculate what its molar mass will be, and I get 76.13. So starting with the number I had from part uh, I, then I say 0 0.31 moles of chlorine. From my equation, I know that for every 3 moles of chlorine, it takes 1 mole of carbon disulfide. One mole of carbon disulfide is 76.13 grams of carbon disulfide. On my calculator, I get 7.8667, which again, two significant figures, so I round that off to 7.9 grams of carbon disulfide. This answer is worth two points, and if you get to that answer, you've gotten your two points. Um, a lot of students across the nation forgot this one to three ratio, okay? So when they see this equation, they just went for they forgot the 1 to 3 ratio. And if they left that off, you lost 1 point. So if you just took the 0 0.31 multiplied by your molar mass, you could get uh, a, a 1 point of the 2. Okay, the next part. At 30 degrees, the reaction is thermodynamically favorable, but no reaction is observed to occur. However, at 120 degrees, the reaction occurs at an observable rate. So the thermodynamically, so delta G, everything says this reaction ought to go, but at 30 degrees, it doesn't happen. And that's like having a, a candle, you know, in a bunch of oxygen. Okay, it, it, you know, thermodynamically, it should go, but until you heat it up or light it, it's not going to happen. So, uh, I explain how the higher temperature affects the collisions, important, between the reactant molecules so that the reaction occurs at an observable rate at 120. So if you heat it up, what happens to the collisions? You're going to get more collisions, but much, much, much more important, you're going to get harder collisions. So you're going to get collisions that have a higher kinetic energy. And why do you need that higher kinetic energy? Is so that you can overcome the activation energy. overcome the activation energy and that's where you earn a point so just saying that there's more collisions that's true but it's not going to explain why this reaction happens at 120 um, they are going to be harder collisions higher higher kinetic energy collisions in the particles why does that make a difference because it helps them overcome the activation energy
so that's worth a point. Now the graph here shows the distribution of the co collision energies of reactant molecules at 120. Draw a second curve on the graph that shows the distribution at 30 degrees. So let's get pull a kind of a cool color like blue. Now this one is a back and forth left and right kind of a graph. Most graphs are up and down vertical. This is a horizontal graph. And if we say we want to have a cooler uh, uh, sample, 30 degrees instead of 120, what that's going to do is going to take this curve and sort of squish it off to the left. So what's going to happen is our curve is going to be up higher here and lower over here. And I have a better picture that I got from the internet. We can see that uh, as our curve is, it gets you know lower and lower and lower, the curve gets squished over to the left. Now what's going to be equal in all these is the area under the curve because it represents a certain number of particles uh, at a certain uh, kinetic energy. So we're looking for squished uh, off to the left a little bit and where the points come in here, one is you get one point for having this graph higher on the left side of the activation energy and you get another point for showing that it's lower on the right side of the kinetic energy. Now we saw that a lot of kids across the nation, they just did this. They were thinking of it as a vertical graph and they just did it shorter for a lower temperature. And you know, they did get one point. They got this point over here, not the one on the left. So you want it squished to the left. Now the uh, part C, S2Cl2 is a product of the reaction. In the box below, complete the Lewis electron dot diagram for S2Cl2 by drawing in all the electron pairs. Well, if I were going to try to do this, my first step is always to give everybody an octet. Because if there are enough electrons, that is what's going to happen. So we'll start by giving everybody an octet, and then we will go back and figure out what's going on from there. So if I have S2Cl2, S has six valence electrons, and six more valence electrons, and each of the chlorines have seven valence electrons. So all together here, I'm going to have uh, 7 and 7 is 14, 6 is 20, 26 electrons is how many I have to deal with. And what have I drawn? I've drawn 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. I've drawn 26 electrons, so this is the correct structure. Everybody here has a single bond. Okay. Um, so there, I just earned one point for drawing that. Now, what's the approximate value of the CSS bond angle? So here, CS and S. Okay, what's my bond angle? Well, you can see that sulfur in the middle, that's what's going to make all the difference. It's got a single bond this way, single bond this way, and it's got two lone pairs. So it's going to be basically tetrahedral, and if it were perfectly uh, ideally, it'd be about 109.5 degrees. And if we saw, well, those lone pairs are going to repel a little bit more than the, than the bonding pairs. So those two lone pairs are actually going to squish it in. So we actually could probably get something like 107, something like that, degrees. And uh, in fact, you get a point for that. And you get a point for anything from 104 up to 110. So if you're anywhere in that ballpark, then you, have a, uh, you earned your point. Now, by the way, going back, if you uh, had a wrong value, if you had a wrong picture, but you did the correct uh, angle for your incorrect picture, then you still got credit for that. So there were people who did like double bond, double bond, and, you know, no lone pairs, and so they said it was 180 degrees, and, you know, they would not get credit for the, um, for the, dot, the electron Lewis dot diagram, but they would get credit for their... Uh, um, angle, so long as they're consistent. Okay, the last part. Carbon tetrachloride can be produced, can also be produced by reacting CHCl3, okay, with Cl2 at 400 degrees, as represented by the equation below. So we have CHCl3 plus Cl2 turns CCl4 plus HCl. At the completion of the reaction, the chemist uh, successfully separates these two chemicals, uh, the CCl4 from the HCl, they're both gases, by cooling the mixture from 400 down to 70. And at that temperature, the CCl4 condenses 
while the HCl gas remains in the gaseous state. So if you cool it down, this guy here will condense first. Okay, and if you cool it even more, you can probably get the HCl to condense. So the first thing here, identify all the types of intermolecular forces present in HCl. Well, with anything, you know, anything with electrons is going to have London dispersion forces. So we definitely know there's going to be London dispersion forces. Now, HCl is going to be a polar molecule because chlorine has a much higher uh, electronegativity than hydrogen, but not so much that it's going to be ionic. So HCl is not ionic. It's an acid, and it will, uh, you know, split up into ions when you put it in a water solution. But this is pure HCl. So it's going to have a slightly negative charge on one side, slightly positive on the other side. So we're going to end up getting attractions here. And we're getting attractions from the positive end of one molecule to the negative end of the other molecule. And that is dipole-dipole interactions. So the, if we want to list all the types of intermolecular forces, we would say that there's London dispersion forces and there's dipole-dipole uh, interactions. No hydrogen bonding. Even though there's hydrogen, there's no hydrogen bonding. Okay, then what can be inferred about the relative strengths of the uh, intermolecular forces in CCl4 liquid and in HCl liquid? Justify your answer in terms of the information above. Well, the CCl4, because that was easier to condense, it condensed at a higher, you know, I said it condensed at 70, and the assumption there is that we're going to have to uh, reduce the HCl way, you know, lower than that in order to get it to condense. So since this uh, CCl4 condenses first, it must have stronger intermolecular forces, stronger than the HCl. So the idea here is, you know, if I have CCl4, this must have strong intermolecular forces compared to the intermolecular forces that are in um, HCl. So H uh, CCl4 is stronger than HCl. Now, some of the students had a little trouble with this in terms of the idea that this is going to be a nice nonpolar molecule. And if there's nonpolar molecule, it's going to have London dispersion forces. Well, that's absolutely true. Okay, this guy will also have London dispersion forces, but, you know, the HCl will also have a dipole-dipole. And, you know, in general, dipole-dipoles are stronger than London dispersion forces, but there's an awful lot of exceptions. You know, because of this big electron cloud, it's going to be very polarizable, and so you're going to get a strong, you know, um, uh, intermolecular force, stronger intermolecular force than you do with the HCl. Now, we're not asking you to predict that, okay? We're just simply saying that, you know, the data says that the HCl, uh, the CCl4 is stronger because it condenses while the HCl remains gaseous. So that just implies that the relative strength of the intermolecular force here in the CCl4 is stronger than in the uh, HCl. And that is this entire question.